This is an upstart candidate. I think you'll be impressed. I know I have been. Welcome in to my state of mind. I am Dan York. It is a pleasure and honor to have you here. I say that most every night, not to be a broken record, but because it's true, and I don't like to be nonchalant about it. Let's start a brand new week together and talk about things that are going on. Cormac Lynch is my guest tonight. He is a very impressive young man, 29 years of, old, uh, years of age, former Marine, uh, has quite a story, and he's running for Congress. And for him, it's personal. I'm still concerned he doesn't have the right kind of funds and operation, but we'll see. You know, this guy might, might just catch fire and might be in the right place at the right time. You'll determine that. Let's go to the rundown. And, oh, boy, huh? Wow. I, it's just like, really? How does that happen? We'll talk about it, and we'll find out exactly what happened if you haven't heard about it already. This is a classic Rhode Island story involving the Supreme Court. Really? They were influenced by a lot of guys. We'll talk to you about that. What else do we have? I think this is a terrific story. In the NHL playoffs, a guy who could blow things up and make a racial conversation all across the globe is just too cool for it. This was not as fast as I thought it was and drove me crazy. And that was a heck of a day. We've got a triple crown story that we're going to have to follow over the next couple of weeks. Let us dig into all that stuff that we had on that screen that Laura had put up. Item number one, she'll put it up again. Yeah, I don't know what to say about that other than, holy cow, we still have young ladies in the hospital that, you know, hanging by your hair. Look, I don't judge the circus. We've all gone to the circus and seen some crazy things. The athleticism, the, the stunt ability, the courage, the moxie, the half craziness of these acrobats and everybody else, uh, always amazes us, and that's why we pay the money, right? But this was bad, and so a little bit of an overview. We know what happened, right? We didn't show the video, but we'll show you a little bit of a piece here. Um, you don't need to see people crashing on the floor. Your imagination can take care of that. Here is cell phone video obtained by Eyewitness News showing the moments before the collapse. In it, an illuminated curtain drops, revealing the hair hang act. Suddenly, the apparatus gives way. Rhode Island hospital officials tell Eyewitness News 11 arrived at the emergency room. Of those 11, six were admitted for treatment. Nearly 4,000 adults and children attended the 11 a.m. performance Sunday. This is a family show with uh, family entertainment. I believe, uh, you know, that there were a lot of families that were disturbed by what they saw. There is a criteria when there's a serious injury uh, that the, uh, the theater goes dark, and that's what happened. Paramedics immediately responded and rendered care to the injured circus personnel. Police evacuated the venue. All shows are now off. That's Larry Lepore, and he runs the, the dunk. I don't see where the liability is for the dunk. I mean, the circus sublets that facility and has all their people that come in and set the whole thing up. My goodness. It, 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 you know, what happened later, Steve Perry, who you see there, talks to Eyewitness News about something this big that did not break right. Public Safety Commissioner Stephen Perry tells Eyewitness News investigators discovered a carabiner clamp that snapped. It's a big metal, you know, four or five inch clamp and uh, it broke. Uh, cleanly it, it broke and uh, whether that caused the collapse or there's others, uh, I don't know. That's going to take some time for OSHA to de make that determination. Look, it was probably very traumatic for some of the families. I don't understand the families that hang around with their kids after the intermission and the whole thing was called, all trying to, you know, ambulance chase and kind of, you know, stretch your neck and rubberneck over the whole thing. Uh, people's curiosity is somewhat weird and morbid sometimes, but I'm sure there are a lot of young kids that may have seen it and got somewhat mortified by the whole thing. You've got to watch them. Uh, Rhode Island Family Services will be on tomorrow night to talk about what happens not only with that incident, but when your kids are shocked by something and how you may want to handle it. So stay tuned for that. All right, next item. The, uh, this is classic. Target 12 has this story. Everybody has this story. This is just a uh, headline. It was uh, Congress Cicilline's brother that went to jail and now has been out for five years. And now John has been reinstated. He's a full-fledged lawyer again. Tim has the story. More than 80 people wrote letters of support for John Cicilline, including one from a former attorney general. John, any comments? In 2008, attorney John Cicilline and his law partner Joseph Bevilacqua Jr. 
pleaded guilty to federal charges out of Boston, including conspiracy and obstruction of justice. Prosecutors say the legal duo shook down their own clients who were accused of drug dealing. Cicilline was immediately stripped of his ability to practice law and sentenced to prison serving 16 months. Now, in a three-to-one vote, the Rhode Island Supreme Court reinstated Cicilline's license to practice law, writing in the decision, the petitioner has paid a heavy price for that error of judgment, and we are confident that he is truly remorseful for his conduct. Among more than 80 letters of support reviewed by Target 12, one was from former Attorney General Patrick Lynch, who wrote, During all of my experience, I found Mr. Cicilline to be one of the finest, hardworking, trustworthy opposing counsel that I encountered. In his application, Cicilline says the experience embarrassed his family and damaged his good name. Former House Speaker and defense lawyer William Murphy has been assigned to monitor Cicilline's law practice for now. Now, Justice William Robinson voted against Cicilline's reinstatement, saying he didn't think the 57-year-old met the criteria to once again become a lawyer. With the Target 12 investigators, Tim White. Eyewitness News. Uh, at least one judge said no. I mean, do you believe that's a classic only in Rhode Island? 80 letters from and around the legal world. So you've got to know a bunch of guys when you're in real trouble. All right, John. Well, you're back to criminal law. Congratulations. And isn't it ironic that the Speaker of the House, former Billy Murphy, is, uh, is watching your P's and Q's? What did you do? Go over to your dad's office, over to Jack's office, and say, uh, how's it going? Anyway, let's go. Next item. I don't, I don't, I just don't get these things sometimes. Uh, leave it on the ice. Leave it on the ice. Yeah, you know what? That's what hockey players do, which is why I think hockey players are amongst the finest athletes and sportsmen in, you know, the big leagues. I mean, I've met some miserable basketball, miserable hockey, I mean, miserable baseball, miserable football players. But hockey players, by and large, are, are perfect gentlemen because they leave it on the ice. There are exceptions, no doubt. But this was a bad situation. Over the, you know, the first game or so, we've had some, you know, Boston fans tweeting out, you know, keyboard courage, little keyboard courage, tweeting out racial comments for this guy, Mr. Zuban, who is a menace on the ice. Yeah, that's him. Thank you, Laura, for throwing that up. That wasn't in our game plan, but she made a call. That's an audible. Nice job, Laura. Uh, but the, uh, we like the kid on this show. Uh, at least I'm not coughing. Uh, you had to be here Friday. But Claude Julian said the right thing about all of this. Poor judgment, poor taste, and we don't associate ourselves with people like that, you know, and uh, uh, the people who think that way are, are not what we call our fans. Uh, they may think they are, but uh, we certainly don't uh, support that uh, at all, and it's a, it's a shame that this is still going around in this day and age that, uh, you know, people are, are still thinking that way, and it's a, it's a, for us, it's a, it's a shame, and, uh, you know, as I mentioned, that's certainly not uh, getting our support on that. Yeah, well, that's, uh, that's the right approach, but the best approach was from P.K. Subban himself, who, while a menace on the ice, said this in diplomatic uh, fashion. This is just an excerpt of uh, what he said to the media. He said, I'm going to talk about this once, I'm not going to talk about it again. What people say on Twitter and social media is not a reflection by any means of the League or the Bruins. It's unfortunate when these things take away from the great hockey that was played two days ago. But he went on and on to, to talk about how, you know, really, it's no big deal for him. You know, he could have created this into some kind of a monster and we could have a national conversation going. But he didn't. And he doesn't get a lot of attention for doing the right thing. But he got mine and he did the right thing. I don't like the Canadians any more than you do. I don't like him on the ice. But I like him. Next item. Just a real quick note. So I'm watching the Cox, you know, running day this weekend is a phenomenal day. They have a great, great thing going on. And here's the headline on, on this whole thing. They, they have a, a 5K, 10K, half marathon, a marathon. But I, I, was watch, I was reading the story. Those are the half marathon winners pictured there. I was reading the story about this guy, Felix Mason, who, according to the text in the story, ran the marathon in 208.23. And I'm thinking, 208.23? Why aren't we, like, sounding the bells of near? I'm sure that's a course record by leaps and bounds, because I follow this stuff. 208.23? I mean, he could have contended for the Boston Marathon. 208.23? Why isn't this front page in all the sports sections? 208.23, and then I flipped to the actual race times. 
It was 238.23. Uh, memo to the journal, hire a proofreader. Thank you very much. Good stuff by Cox, by the way. And finally, Derby Drama. Oh, listen, this, this horse is phenomenal. California Chrome and the story around it, of course, the headlines are all across America, New York Times. Uh, this is a great, great story. $10,000, the total investment for this horse's two parents. And uh, he's won now, uh, you know, millions. Derby's such a great day. Did you watch the Derby? You gotta make time for the Derby. It's an American tradition. I've been there. It's like Woodstock, it's so crazy. But this horse, worth nothing, now is the talk of the horse racing industry and heads to Preakness in just a few weeks. Triple Crown, who knows? But you gotta do research on the story between the owners and the trainer. It's pretty heartwarming. And by the way, I gave you some numbers on Friday night. <clears throat> Your host, I hit the triple. Good weekend. When we come back, Cormac Lynch wants to hit the jackpot in November. Stay with us. I'm very tough on new candidates. You know why? Because I don't like your chain to be jerked around, and I don't, I don't want mine. Uh, but this guy may be a little different. Here's the headline right here. Cormac Lynch to run for first district. Say, who's he, everyone says, right? Well, you know what? He's got a... He's got quite a story. I'm going to introduce him right here. 29-year-old former Marine um, with a great story. Came back from uh, your service to Afghanistan. Your, your East Providence firefighter. Got yourself hurt doing some work at the house. Work. Yep. yep. Um, got yourself educated. Got into into the, uh, the finance business. Yep. Came out of that. Came back here. And now you decide to, to run. I just gave you a resume so we can get to some stuff real quick. Good to see you, man. You too, Dan. Thanks a lot for having me on. Cormac was on the radio with me the other day for a couple of hours, actually, because I was intrigued by your story. And it is a story. I mean, you, you come, you say, from a broken home, and you're kind of self-made. And, and people should look up your story. Yeah. Yeah, I, I appreciate that. I think it's a, it's a can-do American story. Um, I, I think it's kind of a, a referendum of what the Democrats want to turn us into, which is a permanent state of government assistance. And I, I firmly believe if I can do it, anyone can do it. All right, good. So here's what, here's what really grabbed my attention. Here's a, a piece of audio that came back from our coverage of his announcement in Newport a few weeks back. And Laura, if you could roll that. So why has it taken us 13 years and counting to defeat an enemy in Afghanistan that receives no state-sponsored funding, trains on monkey bars, wears ski masks, and fights us with rusted-out AK-47s from the Soviet occupation? It's not because our rank and file. It's not because our men and women on the ground have insufficient will. And it's not because there is inadequate economic reinforcement. It is our civilian leadership, and they must go. Uh, the, the rhetorical uh, level of that performance was at the highest of first-time candidate standards. I told you that on the radio. I'd say it today. So good for you. It's drawn my attention um, and a lot of others. This race is personal for you. Yeah. Tell us why. Tell us that story real quick. Well, like you said, I, ha I have a combat tour to Fallujah. Um, I enlisted in the Marine Corps at 19. I experienced firsthand the sacrifices that, are go that go into perver preserving our way of life and um, into safeguarding America. Um, one of my best friends deployed to Afghanistan last year. He was mobilized with the 19th Special Forces Group of the Rhode Island National Guard. They took a few casualties in September. One of them, Staff Sergeant Timothy McGill, age 30, originally from Bergen County, New Jersey. Um, when, when he was coming home and his family was memorializing them, all four of our representatives, to include the governor, Lincoln Chafee, my opponent, David Cicilline, Jim Langevin, our two senators, Jack Reed, who's a ranking member of the Senate Armed Services Committee, and uh, Sheldon Whitehouse, didn't so much as show up to pay their respects. And, and it's unacceptable. And we're not going to take another trip around their merry-go-rounds when those are the facts. And they don't support veterans. And, and, and they don't respect veterans. We're not going to let them say, um, we support veterans as a political punchline, because they don't. And it's, it's time they're held accountable for it. Um, you know, I, I use an analogy because I understand with 0.74% of our current population serving in the armed forces, people respect it, but sometimes it's beyond their self-concept, right? Sometimes they, they, they can't understand it. Everyone's respective. People often want to know more. 
but sometimes they're not sure what's appropriate and what's not. Um, I went to the uh, Aquidneck Island National Police Parade yesterday, and I saw Colonel O'Donnell leading the Rhode Island State Troopers down Broadway. And they're certainly a remarkable organization, but I couldn't help but draw the parallel. What if one of those young men, one of those young women, was killed in the line of duty in service to their state? Would it be acceptable for our representatives to be a no-show when their families memorialize them? Absolutely not. No, and, and, and it has, and God forbid, the last time we had a, a fallen police officer, right. there was all the pomp and circumstance. And, and so I get it. It's, it's become too much. It's become too nonchalant. Right. For everybody. By right. The way. Of course. And, and I understand it's. Uh, you know, we're in our 13th year of mismanagement in the war in Afghanistan. But the solution to that problem is to get people in Washington to provide proper oversight of the war in Afghanistan, not to turn a blind eye to the peoples who make sacrifices in the war in Afghanistan. All right, I'm going to pause early here. We're going to come back. We're going to lay out some issues. Um, and I see he's brought some notes, so he might actually be talking about the guy he's running against a little bit, which is fun for the show, right? We'll be right back. Don't go anywhere. Right, let me get the touch up, up front, and then we'll get into a couple of issues. Cormac Lynch is my guest. He's running for Congress against David Cicilline in the 1st District. He's a Republican, so you've got a general election timetable, at least, correct? Yes, sir. Um, not much in terms of dough and operational um, width and breadth yet in this campaign. So tell me why a guy who looks the part and speaks the part but has none of the other parts is viable to beat the incumbent David Cicilline. Which incumbent? The one who uh, has tried to pass 20 bills in the legislature and hasn't gotten any done? I, I, the, the, I guess yeah, I, I mean, it, listen, yeah. The, this guy's the Cleveland Browns of politicians, Stan, right? Someone needs to come out and say that. It's a very winnable race. He has a 26% approval rating. He's a 20-year career politician that has not done right by the people of Rhode Island. And I know I'm a new candidate, but a new candidate can say that just as well as an old candidate. And it's time we get some change. Do I have a lot of money now? No, to be brutally honest. I understand I'm at a competitive disadvantage. However, I'm going to say the truth. I'm going to hold them accountable. And I have a website with a donate link. And so far, that's worked out well for us. It's, it's an uphill battle, but we're ready to fight the fight. Uh, Cormac Lynch for Congress? www.cormaclynchforcongress.com. I asked Jess, do we put that? We don't usually do that for candidates, but you know, this guy motivates me a little bit, so what the heck. <laughs> Uh, well, look, we'll see, man. You've got, right. you, you don't have a long run. You know, uh, Brendan Daugherty was, was loaded with dough in a 15% lead at the, at the start of the 2012 campaign and got right. thumped. Uh, it was also a presidential election year, too, with true. Colonel Daugherty. No doubt, yeah. no doubt. But, uh, you know, we'll have plenty of time to see if, you're, if your organizational and financial performance matches your rhetorical performance so far. In the meantime, you brought some notes. What, what, what's the conversation for the day? Well, I, I think we need to uh, do our due diligence, and we're not going to let uh, Congressman Cicilline pass on anything. And, and we're starting with his tenure as mayor of the city of Providence, and it was deplorable. It matches his deplorable representation of District 1 in the U.S. Congress. This is from the internal auditor's report. I, I think he, he kind of got a free pass because... Providence mayoral, Providence internal auditor's report. Correct. Okay. Uh, the city of Providence. While so he was, while, no, after he was mayor, but about what was, was left. Correct. And, and I think, you know, the macroeconomic conditions for all of us were bad. So it was tough amongst that storm to see, well, who's really mismanaging things and who isn't. But now that the storm has passed, we can see who is mismanaging things. And it was Congressman David Cicilline. And it's unacceptable. This is from the city of Providence. While factors and events beyond the city's control contributed to Providence's weakened weakening financial condition, the prior administration did not recommend the difficult choices necessary to avert a financial crisis. The administration did not present a corrective action plan that could have minimized the pending financial meltdown. That's Congressman Cicilline's responsibility. And when you look into the details, when you get into the details, it gets worse. We understand that it was a difficult time for all of us. But if you need to borrow money from the undesignated surplus, like many municipalities needed to, to balance their budget, you get the approval of the city council. All right, here's the thing. He, Look, didn't even, he didn't even do that. I'm sure on the campaign trail you'll talk more and more about this. I did, others did, when this was hot. John Laughlin couldn't make it stick in 2010. Brendan Darty couldn't make it sit, sit, stick in 2012. So how do you think 
in 2014 running for Congress against the congressman about his mayoral resume right. will, will stick. I, I think uh, Congressman Cicilline had the benefit of the future reference when he was running against Laughlin in 2010 because he, was, he, he said, I'm going to do X, Y, and Z as congressman. When well, he ran all against, this wasn't all of this was not out when Laughlin was battling. Correct. But Daugherty had it, and, and it didn't stick. You, you, he's put up the same performance as a congressman as he has as mayor of Providence, and he has. I have more of a, a record to pin him to to than uh, John Laughlin did or, or, or Colonel Dougherty did. We have the highest unemployment rate in the country. This is the same guy who, you know, borrowed $17.5 million from the city's rainy day fund and didn't even consult the city council. It's clear. Look at the economic conditions of our state. It's the same leadership we sent down there, and we need to change the leadership. I'm guessing we're short on time. I'm guessing the tone of this campaign will be as aggressive as today's presentation all the way through. Oh yeah, gloves are off. Gloves Absolutely. Are off. You having fun with this? It, it, it's been exciting. Um, you, you know, it, it's certainly been a thrill, but in, in my heart of hearts, I'm doing the right thing for the right reasons, you know? And learn more about Cormac Lynch at what? Cormac Lynch for Congress? www.cormaclynchforcongress.com. Just a little bit of an appetizer for this guy. He'll be on a bunch. <laughs> He's good TV. And you know what? He could be a hell of a congressman. We'll see how it goes. He's got to raise some money, though, or it don't matter. See you in a bit. We'll be right back. Reaction to what you've seen tonight or any time, 228-1886. State of mind at MyRITV.com and tweet and Facebook post. I ran out of time. I blew by my, my, my segment, so I've got voicemail stacked up, but I'll play yours, too. And we'll do that when we get back here tomorrow night. I'll see you on the radio at noon tomorrow on WPRO and right back here at 7.30 on MyRI TV. You have a great evening. Night, night.